morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Does this work? You got it? Okay. Thanks, Dad. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, if y'all want, let's stand and sing. Uh, our first song is going to be Mighty to Save. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. Our God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. <clears throat> Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. <clears throat> Mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. Our God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Y'all can be seated. Our next song is going to be number 453, Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now say, am I, love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I'll cling. In His blessed presence live, ever His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to Him belongs. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. 
souls in danger look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry way. <clears throat> Master of the sea, billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Uh, just a few announcements as we get going. want to, again, remind everybody, please uh, look to your bulletins for updates to our, our prayer and to our sick list. Uh, reminder that our, our focus family this week is ben and, Janie, ben and Jamie Cunningham and their girls, so keep them in your prayers throughout the course of this week. Uh, a couple of updates to that sick list that, that I'm sure several of you have, uh, have seen or heard of by now, but just a reminder that uh, Barbara Long was sent home on hospice. Uh, and so we definitely want to keep her and, and that family in our prayers. Uh, and then early this morning, uh, as he was jogging, Dylan Burris was attacked by a dog. Um, and so he was taken to the ER in Dyersburg. Uh, he has five stitches in his calf. I think they're on their way home now. But again, just keep them in your prayers this morning as well. Uh, that's a, always a, a very stressful situation to have to deal with something like that. So, uh, But just keep those uh, in, in your thoughts and in your prayers um, and then a few announcements as we, as we get going. May the 30th, that's this Tuesday, uh, we're taking a trip to the St. Louis Zoo. Uh, the van is going to leave the building here at 8 a.m. Uh, you'll need money. Uh, I've been saying that you'll need money for supper and souvenirs. You'll also need money for lunch, or you're more than welcome to, uh, to brown bag it and eat it on the van on the way up there. Uh, but uh, supper and lunch... Uh, or what you'll need money for, as well as souvenirs. We'll be back later that evening. We'll stop uh, in Sykeston for supper at Lambert's. Uh, and so please uh, make plans to be with us for that. Um, also, something that everybody, we, we would love for you to keep in mind, this Thursday, uh, June the 1st, we're hosting the Soul Food Cafe uh, out at the refuge at, at the fairgrounds in Union City. Uh, and so that'll be at 530. Uh, if you can can show up to help serve and clean up for that, uh, we had a fantastic outing uh, or, or showing of support when we did this a year ago. Uh, and so that is this Thursday. Um, so if you're able to help with that in any capacity, please let me know and just make plans to be out there at 530 or a little bit before that so we can prepare for that. That's this Thursday, June the 1st. And then June the 4th, a week from today, is our next Celebration Sunday. There's a lot going on next week. This will be our Senior Sunday to recognize our seniors that we have, this will be Sean and Maddie's first week with us. Uh, so he'll start his ministry here, and we'll have a potluck after services that morning uh, to, to help recognize our seniors and to celebrate all the things that we have going on. Uh, and so please keep that in mind. That's June the 4th, and then June the 5th, that following Monday night, is our first summer youth series of the year. Uh, the van will leave here uh, at 5 p.m., We'll be traveling to the Broad Street Church of Christ in Lexington, Tennessee, uh, and returning later that evening. June the 11th, David French will be down here to give us an update on his work as well as preach that morning. So please keep that in mind. We'd love to see uh, so many people. Uh, uh, we would love to see as many people here for that uh, as possible. So all those dates in mind. And then again, uh, just as a reminder, there is a, a new Sunday morning class starting next Sunday. That's our next quarter. Uh, the 18 to 28 year old class will be down the hallway, uh, and as part of our next quarter on Sunday evening, uh, we'll be doing a Q and A series that we're just going to call either Q and A or you asked for it or something along those lines. But that is a chance for you to submit questions to me uh, to answer on Sunday nights, and we hope that you'll choose to be a part of uh, that as well. So, uh, all that being said, are there any other announcements that we've missed this morning? And if not, we'll go to our Heavenly Father in prayer.
Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you so much for this uh, beautiful day that you've given us. And we're thankful that we can come together at, at, at times like this to, to worship you and lift up your name, Jesus, to glorify you. We pray, dear Father, that we'll, that we'll sing and that we'll pray and that we'll listen attentively and the things that we do today, God, that we'll, we'll glorify you and honor you and that we'll receive something today that will help us to grow in our relationship with you. My dear Father, there's uh, so many people that are, are hurting and suffering and going through uh, trials at this time. And uh, some of those, uh, dear Father, we want to pray for Dylan Burris, who uh, went through a dog attack this morning. you just help him to heal from that and, and recover. Uh, we pray for the family of uh, James Cruz, who lost his wife recently and we pray for that family in their time of loss uh, we pray for uh, matt o'connor and his his ex-wife and the loss of their little nine-year-old daughter this past week and uh, that you'll give them a peace and a feeling of your presence at this time uh, god for uh, al childers and tammy story and others of our community uh, we pray a blessing upon them and dear Father, we remember Barbara Long at this time. As she's at home with hospice, that you'll be with, with her and you'll be with Mike and Christy and Kim and their whole family during this difficult time for them. And dear Father, we, we pray for my mom. As, uh, she's at Cane Creek and she's continued having some health problems. We just pray that you'll bless her and help her that she can get well enough to get the care and uh, treatments that she needs. And we continue to pray for Miss Carney's guy who is well on hospice. And we pray a special blessing on uh, Mr. Johnny that you'll give him a sense of peace and comfort that only you can provide. And that you can be with their whole family during this difficult time for them as well. And God, for we pray for Anita and she may be starting a new chemo soon. We pray that if, that, that will be a success and that she can, her body can take it and that you would just help her to have good days ahead. And dear Father, we pray for Ben and Jamie Cunningham and Olivia and Annalise and Grace this week. We lift up their whole family to you. Uh, we pray that you'll uh, bless their marriage and bless their relationship with each other as a family, and most importantly, their relationship with you. Uh, please help us all to be aware of our family of the weeks as we all lift up that particular person or family uh, to you, that you'll bring uh, blessing to their life. Dear Father, please help us to honor you today, and not only today at this time, but more importantly, we'll honor you through this upcoming week once we leave this building by the words and our actions, that everything we do will show that we belong to you and that we're your disciples and that we truly love you, Jesus, and want to serve you. It's through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, our next song is going to be number 611, Heavenly Sunlight. Walking in sunlight all of my journey, over the mountains, through the deep vale. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, Never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light, in Him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to His side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, Flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah. I am rejoicing, 
singing his praises. Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to <clears throat> above, singing his praises. Gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. All right, our next song is going to be number 382. <clears throat> Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. He gave his precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Why did he drink the bitter cup of sorrow, pain, and woe? Why on the cross be lifted up? Because he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. He gave his precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Till Jesus comes, I'll sing his praise, and then to glory go and reign with him through endless days because he loved me so he loved me so he loved me so he gave his precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. How many times have we overlooked a blessing? How many people have this with them today? Raise your hand. Do you know this is a blessing? Not just because it's the word of God, but how long have people been able to have their own copy of the Bible? Does anybody know? Nearly 600. Gutenberg invented the printing press in 1440 A.D. Up until that time, it had to be done by scribes, hand writing. Do you know how long it takes to copy this by hand? A guy by the name of John K. Smith in, in, in 2017, six years ago, decided to find out using multiple ink pens and his own hand, it took him four years to copy the new American Standard Bible word 
for word. Before that time, before Gutenberg invented the press, the printing press, it was done by scribes. And unless you were exceedingly wealthy, you could not own your own copy of the Bible. And then a man by the name of William Tyndall translated it into English from the Latin Vulgate. As a reward for his effort, King Henry VIII, and I bet everybody's heard of that character, he had six wives. In 1536, he had William Tyndall killed by strangulation and then burned his body at the stake for heresy because he had dared to translate the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into English where the commoner could read it. Up until that time, most people were uneducated, could not read, and they had to depend on the preacher or the priest to tell them what it said. With his work, which cost him his life, everybody could read it themselves. Psalm 46, verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Jesus Matthew 10, Mark 3, and in Luke 12, or Luke 6, rather, recounts how he chose the 12 apostles. Before he picked them, he went up into a mountain and prayed all night to God. He prayed all night, and we're worried about five minutes of remembering the death of that man who was his, the son of God. So for the next few minutes, let's give thanks, number one, that we have our own copy, that we all can read English, because I bet there's not too many of us who could read Latin. And let's be thankful for what Jesus did. And as we learned in Acts 2, long time ago, God had planned out that this would happen. Nobody took his life from him. He willingly laid it down. So this bread represents his body. So go back for the next few minutes and let's reflect on the sacrifice that God made so that we could be saved from our sins and never die. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all that you've done through the ages to bring the knowledge of Jesus, your son, to us today. And for the act that he went through, knowing full well that there was no other way that sins could be forgiven unless his blood was shed. Forgive us of our sins, Father. And as we partake of this bread, help us to remember the sacrifice that your son made because you did not even spare your son. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Dear Father, we thank you again for the sacrifice of Jesus because the Hebrew writer tells us without the shedding of blood there can be no forgiveness of sins. As we partake of this, the red juice, help us to remember and picture in our minds Jesus as he hung on the cross with blood dripping from his hands and feet and out of his left side. Forgive us and may we always be thankful and meditate on the love you have for us and the sacrifice that sin required. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As a final note, the King James Bible, first edition, 1611, was about 75 years after William Tyndall died. The first edition of the King James Version of our Bible was taken 95% word for word from William Tyndall's translation of the Vulgate into English. So we have a lot of people to thank for where we are today and providing us with God's word. And God loves a cheerful giver. So let's be thankful for all those that went before us, but especially thankful to God. And let's give him what is due him with a clear conscience and a cheerful heart. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you a portion of what you've already given us. Help us never to forget all the physical blessings we have, including having our own copy of your word. Forgive us and bless us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
next song will be number 509. <clears throat> number 509. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Threw his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. <clears throat> then he'll bear me over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. All right, at this time children are dismissed to Children's Church. While we'll do that, we're going to sing number 957. <clears throat> number 957. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I'll know He'll take me through, though I am weak and poor. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore.
Well, good morning. <clears throat> it is a great day to work for our God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I am so glad that you are here. Uh, if you're joining us uh, online, I'm thankful that you've tuned in. Uh, I know with it being the, the holiday weekend that there's several of our number who may be traveling this week, and we certainly wish uh, safety for them. Uh, but I'm glad that whether you are here with us in person or online, that you have chosen to begin your week uh, worshiping our God together. In a few moments, we're going to sing an invitation song, at which time two of our shepherds are going to be in the back and would love nothing more, uh, that if you have something that we can help you with this morning, that you go and see them and talk to them. Uh, Let us assist you in in whatever that need may be. If you've been with us over the last several weeks, you know that we've been working through a series that we've just called Kingdom Living, right? And, And this is kind of a series that's been all about just that, Kingdom Living, what it takes to live within the kingdom of God, right? We started this whole series by defining what that kingdom was, what the New Testament tells us that kingdom is. And we decided that the best definition, biblically speaking, for what the kingdom of God is, is that it's community that's built by God to be with God. We started looking at whose authority we're under as a part of that kingdom. And then last week we took a look at how far does that kingdom expand, right? Our relationship with one another. The, uh, the idea that we have brothers and sisters in Christ goes far beyond just this physical location. If you allow the building in which you worship to dictate your relationship to other Christians, you've done yourself a great disservice in limiting those who you have the ability to reach out to. Now, are you going to be closer with those that you worship with on a regular basis? Absolutely. But just because you worship here and we've got brothers and sisters down the road at Exchange Street doesn't mean that the kingdom of God stops and starts in one place and picks up in another. We're all part of that kingdom. And moving on, spoiler alert by the way, moving on over the next couple of months after today, we're going to really start focusing on things that we do how we represent the kingdom of God in different areas of our life. What are the attributes, the values, the priorities that we're supposed to have? How do we interact with those that are outside of the kingdom of God, especially when they might have difficult questions? But everything that we're going to talk about and everything that we have talked about really doesn't make any real difference if we don't talk about what we're going to talk about today. That's why our topic this morning is discussing how do we enter the kingdom of God? How do we become a citizen? of that kingdom that is spoken of in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19 says, So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, Our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So how is it that we become citizens of the kingdom of God? Right, Because that's the whole point. Right, We're talking about kingdom living. There's no point in living for a kingdom if we don't know how to become a part of that kingdom. And so that becomes the natural question. It's a question that we have to answer. Before we talk about anything else, we have to figure out how do we become a part of that kingdom. Because it doesn't happen by accident. Nobody ever accidentally became a Christian, right? There may be some unlikely ways that we're introduced to Jesus. There may be some unlikely studies, unlikely relationships. But nobody ever becomes a Christian. Nobody ever enters the kingdom of God by accident. Years and years and years ago, you became a citizen of a kingdom really through one of two ways. You go back and you study ancient history, there was one of two ways that you became a citizen of a kingdom. Number one was that you were conquered and taken over by an opposing force, right? This was a a not necessarily ideal scenario for those that lived within it, right? This is how those uh, empires that we talk about, the, the, the Khan Empire and all, all these great empires that you read of in, in ancient history, that's how they expanded their kingdom. That's how they gained more citizens by basically marching through and saying, hey, you belong to us now, right? And so they would take opposing kingdoms by force. The other way that you gain a kingdom was really, out of necessity sometimes, a pooling of resources, If two kingdoms wanted to uh, really extend their reach of power, but they didn't want to go through the process of having a war with one another, a lot of times what would happen is one king would say, well, I've got a son and you've got a daughter. Why don't we just, you know, throw a big party, get them married, and now we've combined our two kingdoms into one. And the point of both of those instances is, is that the common people, those who were just citizens of that kingdom, really had no part in or choice in who they were a citizen under, right? Either they were taken hold of by an, uh, an opposing kingdom or those that were in charge, quote unquote, decided for them. 
But see, with the kingdom of God, that's not the case. The kingdom with God, the, the kingdom of heaven, we decide whether or not we want to be a part of it. The choice to enter that kingdom really all boils down to us. And that's why I think it's so interesting. I said this, I think I said this on Sunday night several weeks ago, uh, that I get a lot of really strange looks. So this is one of those things that I tell you to pay attention to me really close because I don't want anybody to like half hear what I'm saying. But I get a lot of really weird looks when I have conversations with people when I say that I believe God is very much pro-choice. Because when I say that, I get, some of you are giving me that same weird look because you're waiting for the explanation. I appreciate that. When I say that, your mind immediately goes to a political agenda, right? But when I say that God is pro-choice, what I mean is, is that God has given you the ability to choose. God wants you to choose. He's not somebody who's going to force you to do anything that you do or don't want to do. He wants you to choose. He's given you that free will. And what he wants you to choose is he wants you to choose to be a part of his kingdom. But ultimately, the decision is going to come down to you. Nobody's going to force you to do it. Nobody's going to force you to live the way that God wants you to choose to live. And so if you look at today, if you want to become a citizen of a country, there are standards that you have to meet. There are rules that you have to follow. There are processes by which you have to go through in order to become a citizen of another country. And there's no difference when it comes to entering the kingdom of God. And so what is that process? Right? Those are the questions. What are those standards? And that's what we're going to look at for just a few moments this morning. All of those things, the processes, the standards, the expectations that you have, all of them begin with denial. You see, we have to acknowledge that if we're going to become citizens of the kingdom of God, we have to first and foremost understand that there is absolutely no room for self. We cannot become members of the kingdom of God and still have our interests above God's. We cannot be called citizens of the kingdom of heaven and still have our priorities at the heart of why we live. We can't have selfish motives. We can't live our life thinking about what's in it for us. The only way that we get to hope to be a part of the kingdom of God is by understanding that we have to deny ourselves first. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. This is probably one of the most popular passages in the entire Bible in the sense of this topic of denial. right? But in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, then he said to them, this being Jesus, if anybody wants to follow me, let him what? Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Forever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. And then you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. It says, To take off the former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by the deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on a new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity and truth. We have to acknowledge that what goes into denying ourselves is understanding that we are putting away the person that we used to be. We are denying the priorities that we used to have. We are focusing more so on what God wants for us as opposed to what we want for ourselves because oftentimes those two things conflict with each other, don't they? We say all the time that I want to be a child of God. I want to follow God. I want to make sure that my will and His will combine. And we say that, and, and I really do legitimately believe that we have the best motives and the best intentions when we say that. But then all of a sudden, there becomes a very hard decision. And how often do our priorities end up winning out? How often do we run out of time and we think, well, I'm not going to prioritize maybe studying or, or praying or, or some of those things because we get busy. We get busy, we get tired, we get stressed, we get sick. And so all of those things, now all of a sudden life is challenging me. And life is saying, look, you need to focus on you for a little bit and God will be there when you get better. God will be, be there when you get a little bit more time on your hands. God will be there when your kids aren't being so annoying. But at the end of the day, the Bible says that if we're going to be followers of God, if we're going to be members of the kingdom of heaven... It means that we prioritize what God prioritizes. We deny ourselves. It's not about us anymore. Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 and 25 says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, For we know that the old self was crucified with him so that the body might not be or so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved 
to sin. You see, there's an old self and a new self when it comes to being a part of the kingdom of God. The old self, the Bible paints that picture, is to be crucified, to be put away, to be put to death, to, to be gotten rid of. And so entering the kingdom of God begins with denial, because if we can't get that part down, none of the rest of it matters. If we can't figure out that part of, if not the most important part of being a part of the kingdom of God means denying ourselves, nothing we do from that point on is going to make any difference. Because everything that we do from that point on is going to be tainted by the image of saying, what do I want? What is going to be the best thing for me? What is in it for me? Anybody ever met somebody like that, by the way? All right, me and my brother used to do this all the time. My dad, I've told you before that my dad was an auctioneer growing up. And so naturally, uh, me and my brother, especially in our teenage years, we got recruited, uh, voluntold is the, the right term there, right? Uh, but we got voluntold a lot that, hey, this Saturday, uh, we've got to go load up a truck because my dad bought yet another storage building full of junk to auction off, right? And oftentimes, my brother and I, our first reaction would be, y'all probably know this, right? What was your first reaction to that, right? Well, what's in it for us, right? There was a time in my life where uh, Larry Balkan, my dad's auction partner, and, and my dad, we were working as ringmen for him at his auctions, right? And, and for a little while, my brother and I got paid. We were part of the paid help ring crew. And, and I never forget the first time that we worked an auction where we didn't get paid. And all of a sudden, I was like, hey, wait a minute. Why did I just do everything that I just did? Because we were focused on what? We were focused on what's in it for us. I didn't want to wake up at 4.30 in the morning on a Saturday to go haul a bunch of heavy stuff into somebody's yard and watch a bunch of strangers fight over it. But I did. Not because I, 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 you know, but I did so at that time because I was thinking about what's in it for me, right? And there were a lot of perks as a kid to doing that, right? You got paid, you got free sausage biscuits because granddad would come down with free sausage biscuits. There was a lot of that, but it was always about what's in it for me. How often do we approach being a Christian that way, right? We'll talk about this in a few minutes because there are absolutely benefits to being a part of the kingdom of God. But those benefits that we have come out of a desire and a love for Christ, not because we live as a part of the kingdom with the mentality of, well, what am I going to get out of this? One of the things that, that I, always, I always struggled with talking with non-Christians as a youth minister and, and now a preacher, right, is, well, why should I be a part of the kingdom of God? Sell it to me. And don't get me wrong. I think that the kingdom of God is one of the greatest things ever, but it's hard for me to want to sell somebody Jesus. Does that make sense? Not in the sense that I think they don't need Jesus, but in the sense of saying, look, you've got to get past the mindset of going, what's in it for me? You've got to get past the mindset of, I'm only going to do this if it benefits me. And we move past that. As we grow and mature as Christians, we move past that in an understanding of looking at we serve Christ because of the love that he had for us. But as we mature and as we grow, it becomes very key that we deny ourselves. If we can't bring ourselves to deny our own flesh, we'll never be able to enter into that kingdom. And if we can't fully get behind the idea of denial, if we can't 100% surrender ourselves to God, then we'll never be able to pursue the action that is required of us entering the kingdom of heaven. I said a few weeks ago that as Christians, we have to be more than people who just believe some things. Anybody remember me saying that? As Christians, we are more than just people who believe some things. Belief is important, yes. Faith is crucial, absolutely. But living the Christian life has always been and will always be a life of action. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 23. Again, a fairly popular passage that you've probably all heard at some point. Jesus is saying, Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You see, it takes more than just claiming a belief in Jesus. It takes more than just calling yourself a Christian. It takes more than saying, I'm a good person, I believe in God, and that should be good enough. It takes more than that. It takes living a life of obedient action to God and using His Word as the standard for the way that we live. I'm not trying to scare anybody this morning, but this particular verse should intimidate us a little bit. 
I mean, if we're, being re- if we're being really honest with ourselves, a lot of what we read in the Bible should intimidate us a little bit. There are a lot of parts of the Bible that we look at and we're so grateful. Thank goodness for the grace of God, right? And we'll get to that in a minute. But there are verses in the Bible that should intimidate us just a little bit. This is one. Understanding the high expectations that God has for you as members of His kingdom. To understand how much dedication, how much diligence goes into living the life of a Christian. When Jesus says that there are going to be people on the day of judgment that said, Lord, we did this for you. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We went to church for you. And yet God will look at them and say, depart from me. Because it takes more than that. It takes living a life of action. And it all begins with arguably the most important action a person can take in their entire life. The action that fully represents the 100% surrender, the denial of who you are, is the action of baptism. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, Jesus replied, having spoken with Nicodemus here, he says, Jesus replied, truly I tell you, unless somebody is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Of course, Nicodemus replies, how can anybody be born again when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time? And Jesus answered, truly, I tell you, unless somebody is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 through 29 says, for those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ because there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male or female since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. You see, the Bible could not be any clearer concerning this topic. There is zero room for debate in that you cannot enter the kingdom of God without being baptized for the remission of your sins. You cannot enter the kingdom of God without putting Him on, being in Him and that's not the end of the process. One of the things that a buddy of mine talked to, a buddy of mine and I talked about earlier this week is one of the reasons that we have pet peeves within the church. One of our pet peeves within the church is that for so long we've treated baptism as kind of the end goal, right? When raising kids, we think the older a kid gets, the worse off they are if they haven't gotten baptized yet. And yet at the end of the day, we, we get them baptized. We go, hey, that's awesome. You're a Christian. Go change the world. And we think that that's the end of it. And when actuality, entering that kingdom of God, being baptized for the mission of your sins, becoming a Christian, is really just the beginning of the process. You have to live a life of action according to the will of God. Which brings us to this last point. You have to assimilate yourself to Jesus Christ. If you're ever in our small groups, you'll remember that we did uh, several things at the very beginning of each class that we were a part of. One of those things that we did uh, was, was tell me about a mustard seed that you had found in the sermon this morning. Uh, and a mustard seed was something that I got from, from a, a preacher named Jerry Barber, and he would talk about how it was one little phrase, one point, one verse, one illustration, one something that I was going to be able to hang on to. His philosophy was, I try not to learn too much, because the more I learn, the more I'll forget. So his philosophy was, if you just pick a mustard seed, out of the sermon, to apply to your life, to write down, to focus on, to remember, then you would be able to do great things. After all, the Bible says if we have faith like a mustard seed, we can move mountains, right? So it seemed to add up that remembering those tiny things could be a big difference. And it was just a phrase or an application, something that stuck with us to be able to grow closer to God and and apply it to our lives. And so this week, I'm actually going to give you the mustard seed. You ready? Everybody get out your pens and paper, little note apps on your phone. I'm going to give you the mustard seed this week. All right? This is the mustard seed. Being a citizen of the kingdom of God means being in Christ. If you just want to put quotes there and just put in Christ, that's the mustard seed. That's what it takes to be a member of the kingdom of heaven. That's what it means to be a citizen of God's kingdom. To be called one of His means being in Christ. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. We're not going to read all of it. But John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, Jesus paints this beautiful illustration of what it really means to be in Christ. Verse 4, He says, Remain in Me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. 
Neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. And if anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out aside like a branch that withers and then is garnered and thrown into the fire and they are burned. Jesus says that I am the vine. You have to be attached to me. You have to be in me if you're going to produce the fruit that I want you to produce. Abiding in Him means living a new life. I think so often we, we fail to paint that picture when it comes to baptism, right? We, we talk about all the time how you're being baptized for the mission of your sins and you're a new person now. And that's absolutely right. You are. But being a new person means that you are putting away who you used to be. Because so often as Christians whether you're a new convert or you've been a member of God's kingdom for 50 some odd years, so often as Christians, we want to hold on to God with one hand and hold on to ourselves with the other. We want to embrace the new life and try to receive the benefits that we get from God for being a part of His kingdom, but we also want to hold on to all of our old habits and our old friends and all of our old things that that made us lost. And we can't do that. Being a new person means striving to live by the higher standard and doing the things that God expects me to do. But I don't want to confuse anybody this morning. Do not think that that means that you and I get to do enough to enter into His kingdom. We don't do things to merit our own salvation. You and I are not good enough. I'll never forget, we were sitting uh, in, a, in a church at Tupelo, we were sitting on the front pew, and a 92-year-old lady had come in and was re-baptized for, I think, about the third time in her life. And I remember she, she told the secretary, she said, I hope I've just done enough to get to heaven. And that's heartbreaking. Because the fact of the matter is, you can't. You can't do enough to get to heaven. You don't merit your own salvation. You don't have some point system that that every good deed that you do is so many points, and once you've hit like 5,000, then you're good to go, right? There's not a deduction of points for, for the bad things that you do in your life, but we live and we try to walk in the light as He is in the light, and we rely on His grace and His gift to us. We don't do enough to enter His kingdom. We don't merit our own salvation, but... Assimilating ourselves to Christ means that we do things because we are new creatures in Him. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 10 says, You are saved by grace through faith, and it's not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works so that one can boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. We live out of a love for Him. We do the things that we do out of a love for Him. We don't enter the kingdom by ourselves, we enter the kingdom because He allows us to be there. And there's a balance that has to be had. I've said it last week. I think it was last week, right? Maybe it was two weeks ago. You cannot over-preach the grace of God. But grace does not make sin safe. And so how do we enter the kingdom of God? How is it that we become citizens of Him? How is it that we are called His children? How do we abide in Christ? Well, it starts by denying ourselves. Putting aside the things that we want and focusing on the things that God wants for us. Doing so out of a love and admiration for Him. And that that love and admiration, that realizing of what He's done for us, the gifts that He's given us, the fact that He sent His Son to die for us, That appreciation and that overpouring of love that we have because of what He's given us leads us to acting out on our faith. Living a life that shows people He's different. That we're called salt and light. That people understand that we do things for different motivations than what the world would expect of us. Acting out our faith means putting Him on in baptism. Understanding that there's no salvation without that. And once our sins are washed away, we get to live our lives showing our love and faith to others with the intention of representing Christ. And when we do that, we manage to assimilate ourselves and be and dwell in Him, walking in the light as He is in the light. Because if we are not in Christ, we are not a part of His kingdom. And if we aren't a part of that kingdom, we miss out on all of the amazing benefits that that kingdom has to offer. 
right? The Bible tells us about all these things, about the close relationship that we get to have with God, the fellowship that we get to have with one another, the joy, the peace, the gift of His Spirit, the hope that we have that others don't, of having a future with Him. Doing all of that, not out of a fear of punishment, but out of a love for Christ. And so this morning, if you have once been a part of that kingdom, if at one point in your life you submitted to the authority of God, you were totally surrendered to Him, but over the course of time things got hard, life got busy, your faith struggled, and you aren't drawing closer to Him. In fact, maybe you find yourself this morning in a position where you're, you're trying to get away from God a little bit. You blame Him for maybe some of the bad things that have happened in your life. Maybe this morning you want to be a part of that kingdom. Maybe you're struggling with this idea of committing to Him and you realize that what you need to do and what you don't want to wait any longer and you want to put that faith into action, you want to be baptized for the mission of your sins and become a child of God. Maybe there's something this morning that you just need help with, that you have struggles, that you have fears, that you have apprehensions, and you just need somebody to love you. If you have any need, please let us help you this morning as we stand and as we sing. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide it trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands, and time is in the <clears throat> end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son. The lion and the lamb, the lion and the lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. helped at uh, the house on Cochran Street. Uh, a bunch came last Saturday, and then some ladies went over there this past week and did a tremendous job of getting the house ready for Sean and Maddie. They will be here sometime tonight, later on between 6 and 8, and uh, some of us are going to try to get over and help them unload stuff when they get here. So uh, if you can't help out, just let us know. But uh, we're excited about them being here. And uh, excited about them coming. So let's go ahead and find prayer. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for this day you've given us. What a glorious day it is. And how great you are, dear Father. We're thankful for all your blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for this day that we have to worship you and to lift you up. And Father, we ask uh, blessings upon the Cunningham family as we leave this place today. We ask our blessings upon that family. What a true blessing they are to us here. And so thankful to have them with us. Just bless that family and 
continue to walk with them and lead them in all that they do. Father, we're also mindful today of Sean and Maddie and Everett coming our way. We ask safe travels as they come that way. We're excited about them being here, and we're so thankful for you leading them to us. And we hope and pray that all things will work together for them as they come and that we can continue to move forward and uh, serve they can serve this congregation. And Father, I also want to thank uh, for Nathan and Chelsea and their family as they work and labor here and just all that they do for us here. Thank you so much for them. Father, we're uh, mindful of many that's been mentioned that are going through some struggles of life and challenges of life, but we know you're a faithful God that you'll walk through with, walk with us through those things, and we ask that you walk with those that are going through those challenges of life and be with them and give them strength. And Father, may we have hearts and wisdom and open our eyes to see the challenges that others have. And may we walk through that and we, may we let the Spirit lead us to help others and to serve others as we go through this life. Father, as we leave this place, help us to keep our mind and focus on you, that our priorities are towards you, and that we become citizens of this kingdom, that we show this world what it means to be part of that kingdom. And help us to show the love to others that we come in contact with each and every day. Go with us, forgive us when we do wrong, and bring us back each and every time we have an opportunity to be together as a family of yours. For it's in your son's precious name we do pray. Amen.